Quite a, quite a number of years ago, um, I was on a mission strip uh, in Mozambique, on the east coast of Mozambique, about halfway up that long country. And uh, the plan of the mission was simple. We would go there and we would encourage some of the churches, some of the leaders there. Uh, but also the plan was to, to have some crusades. So in the evenings, we would go into these, to this village that was really, uh, really just so secluded. Um, we would go to this village and, and we would preach the gospel with the aim to plant the church uh, during our week in Mozambique. So that was the plan. It was quite simple. Um, but one of the reasons we went on this trip, my brother and I, now this was quite a few years ago, is there was this one man that led the trip that we just felt, well, we want to rub shoulders with this man. He was a guy that God mightily used with, you know, just signs and wonders. Uh, there were so many stories of him praying and, and people standing out of wheelchairs and cancers being coughed out of people's throats as they were prayed for, etc. And we wanted to just be in that vicinity, uh, rub shoulders with the guy, ask questions, listen to stories, be encouraged. And that was part of the trip. And so whenever we went to these villages and we would speak to these people, you know, my brother and I, he was he's about six years younger than me. We always made sure that we were the ones that shared the car with this guy. I mean, we, we really just hogged the car. We didn't give anyone any turns. We just wanted to be with this guy to listen to his stories. But now years ago, thinking back, I hardly remember any of his stories. But one particular event that I do remember from this trip was as we made our way out of Mozambique back to South Africa, and as we came closer to the border, this man, all of a sudden, he just lifted up his voice and he started speaking to the border post. He, he started saying, he, he said, I, I speak to you, border post. I speak to you, spirit of deception and spirit of, uh, you know, spirit of, of, of corruption and bribery. And I command you to let us through. You will not hinder these people. They, these, these are blood um, washed children of the living God. And so we come, we're representing Christ and his kingdom. You will not hinder us. We will not be, you know, fall into your destruction and he starts speaking for about i don't know 45 seconds to a minute he starts just speaking these things out speaking almost as a sense just this life of god over our of our journey and over our uh, our encounter with the border you see the borders at that mozambique border post particularly it, it's a place prone for prone to corruption and bribery you know you get guys with the, with the ak-47 rifle standing next to your window asking for a bribe and for a Christian, that presents a particular dilemma. And so that's a difficult thing. So you've got this guy just speaking these things, speaking these words of life, as it were, over the situation. I just remember looking at my brother, him looking at me, our eyes just big and round, like what on earth just happened? What was that? Now, later on, as I pondered what happened, I was, I was, I was confronted with a question or the way that, I'm, that I took this in is, was it biblical? You know, is it a biblical thing to do for, for someone to speak the words of God in a sense, to speak life into a situation over rulers and authorities and things that, that can, can cause destruction, um, like what we found at the Mozambique border so often? You know, and when I think about that question, the first text that comes to mind is Ezekiel chapter 37. In Ezekiel 37, just did the concept of a man speaking, speaking as it, as it were, just the words that God gives to him to speak. And as he speaks, life comes through his words. In Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel tells the story. He says he was in this vision. And God tells him, I want you to speak, Ezekiel. I want you to prophesy these words. He says he, he was taken by God into this valley of dead, dry bones. You know, dry bones. I mean, the type of bones that, that your dog won't even want to lick. It's dry bones. There's nothing left on them. And so God, Ezekiel, um, sorry, God asks Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, well, Lord, only you know. Only you. I mean, this is a dire situation. These bones were dry. They were dead. They were lying there all across the land. And so God says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy and speak my words. I want you to prophesy and say, dry bones, I will send breath unto you and you will live. I will put tendons on you. I will, I will clothe you with flesh and I will cover you with skin. I will breathe into you and you shall live. And Ezekiel writes, he says, that's what he did. He spoke those words that God gave him to speak. He said, I will breathe into you. I will put tendons and flesh on you and I will cover you with skin. You shall live. 
And amazingly, he says, as he spoke those things, and as he sp spoke just the, the life of God into that situation, he says he just heard a rattling sound of bones coming together, tendons appearing, that, you know, these skeletons being clothed with, with flesh and covered with skin, but they weren't alive yet. And so God says to Ezekiel, now I want you to, to say, I want you to speak these words, to say it, to prophesy it, speak over the, the breath and say breath of God into these, into these bodies so that they may live. And so Ezekiel does, the, does that. He says, oh, breath, come from the four winds and fill these people. And that's what it does. That's what God just did there. And so he took them from these dry bones. And, and all of a sudden, the result of Ezekiel speaking, the very words of God, speaking life, is the dry bones turned into a vast army, the Bible says. Now, of course, that's a vision. We might refer to some old, other Old Testament texts as well. But my thing was, my question is, is this type of speaking, speaking the life of God into a dire situation, a situation of utter destruction caused by sin and the fall, like sickness, like illness, like Israel being in exile, as we find in Ezekiel 37? Is it biblical? Is it something that we can do today? Then I think about Jesus. How often did he not do this? John chapter 11, his friend friend Lazarus is dead and so they call Jesus he comes to the grave and this is what he does he prays to God and this is what you would expect him to do right he prays to God but instead of praying to God and saying God won't you raise Lazarus from the dead he says father thank you that you hear me he then turns to the tomb and then he speaks as it were the words of God God speaks through him to to bring about his will so he speaks to Lazarus and says Lazarus come forth and the man is raised from the dead again it's the speaking of life by jesus almost as a sense on behalf of god and then of course you can look at the new testament so now i'm thinking it's old testament i can see it it's jesus i can see it but what about the new testament what about the, the you know people under the new covenant after jesus the disciples acts chapter 3 my attention was was brought to that you find the story again of peter and john just going up to the temple and as they approach the one gate, the gate called Beautiful, as we know, you might, you know this story. They find a beggar there, a blind beggar. The man is crippled. He, he cannot walk. He's paralyzed. And the Bible tells us that, that Peter and John looks at this, at this guy and says to him, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And the man is healed. He starts to walk. Again, it is the speaking of life into a dire situation that has been caused by the fall, that's been caused by the destruction of sin, um, uh, you know, um, over the world. And so Foster reminds us, and this is the three questions I want to ask briefly this morning in our time together, is what is this speaking of life? This, this speaking, as it were, the words of God into these dire situations, you know, situations of sickness and illness and dry bones. What is it? That's my first question. And the answer Foster gives us, it's called authoritative prayer authoritative prayer it is in a sense the calling forth the speaking of and the calling forth of the will of god on earth as it is in heaven you see in a lot of our in lots of our prayer it is a speaking to god but in authoritative prayer it is a speaking as a sense for god it's being the mouthpiece of the lord it, it's, it, it's it's god using our mouths the people of god's mouths to bring forth his will on earth it's the by the authority that is given to us Pastor draws our attention to a story in Exodus 14 of the Israelites. Um, at this stage, they, they escaped Egypt. They, were all, they all made it all the way up to the Red Sea. But the Egyptians came after them. I mean, this must have been one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful army of the time, coming, charging down upon the Israelites. And in front of them, they've got a massive ocean. So what would you do if you were in their position? Obviously, you would cry out to God, which is exactly what they did. But interestingly, God says this. He says, speaks to Moses. He says, Moses, why are you praying? Why are you crying out to me? He says, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand and divide the sea. In a sense, it's a, it's a strangest concept. God is saying to him, don't pray to me in this moment. I want you to use the authority that I've given to you and exercise that authority. Now is not the time. Yes, praying, obviously, a lot. But now, now is the time for you to act. Now is the time for you to use, use your authority that I've given to you. And, and act. The second question I want to ask now is what type of authority? I mean, what gives us the right 
to, to speak, as it were, on behalf of God, to use authority to speak the life of God into a situation like this? Quite simply put, the answer is Jesus. You see, Matthew chapter 28, we know the second, we know the second part of this chapter where he says, go into all nations to make disciples of all men. But the sentence just before this, he says the following. He says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go and be my representatives. You see, we have to understand the cross of Jesus. We have to understand that he came not only to forgive our sins and make us one with God and right with God, reconcile us back to God, but also he came to restore and recover. You know, it's not just so that we can die and then go to heaven one day. No, he actually came to, uh, to, to, to conquer uh, evil and, and destruction that has been caused by the fall, to reverse things as it were, to back to the, uh, to the way they were um, at, at the start. And so Jesus comes and the authority that Adam lost to, uh, to, the, to Satan and to the dominions, um, you know, just obvious order, Jesus came and he restored those things back to the church. So when we speak about authority, who gives us that authority? I mean, if someone, asks, if someone says the audacity, how dare you speak that way? Well, Jesus gave us that authority. And therefore, because the jailer has been overthrown, he has given us the keys now to go and unlock the captives. Lastly, I want to ask, answer one more question. Just we've spoken about what it's called. This speaking of life, it's called authoritative prayer. We've seen that the authority comes from Jesus. It's not something we muster up or something we deserve. You know that that makes us something special. We get it from Jesus as He sends us. And lastly, what is it primarily used for? And the answer is warfare. Warfare. You see, it Foster reminds us so well that we are in a war. We are in a war, and through this authoritative prayer, it says as if God is using our prayers to invade enemy territory to establish his kingdom. We invade enemy territory to establish his kingdom. Martin Luther, the great reformer, spoke about the triad of enemies. We have the flesh, the world, and the devil. Of course, the flesh speaking about that part of us that is so easily seduced to follow just the patterns of this world that is anti-God. The world is not speaking about the people, but it's speaking about those structures, those patterns, those ways of thinking, those worldviews that are contradictory to what God has revealed about himself and his will. And of course, we know all about the devil. So those are our enemies. So, and so we use authoritative prayer then to address these things, to address our own flesh, to say to ourselves and to our flesh, to our emotions, to our mindsets, to the desires of our hearts that are contrary to God and God's character and God's will, we use authoritative prayer to address even ourselves. We also use it to address then the world, the systems, the strongholds over people, over ourselves and those we love and our neighbors, to come with words that command them to leave, to command any evil influence to leave uh, those type of people. And so it's used for warfare. What is it used? What is it not for? Maybe I can answer that question before we conclude this morning. It's not used for personal gain. You know, so Foster just reminds us this is to be used with compassion. It's to be to be used with a discernment. What is God saying? It's not us. It's God who wants to speak. It's to be do, done with prudence by using our heads and not, you know, losing our, losing our minds. And so it's not to be used for selfish gain. You cannot speak to your bank account. I can see some of you asking that question. Can I speak to my bank account? It's a pretty dire situation there. No, you can't. You can't speak to your, your bank account. You can't speak to your weight or your wrinkles. They are there. Unfortunately, there's other ways to get rid of that. But this is, the, this is all about bringing, bringing about the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. It is about God establishing his kingdom on earth and using us, his people, to do so through authoritative prayer. And so my friend at the border, now after all these years and after having read uh, Foster's book on authoritative prayer, I think he was onto something by praying that way. So friends, this morning, I, I just want to move us on a little bit. I think sometimes when it comes to something like this, we, uh, we don't always have the words. We don't always understand how to pray and what to say. And so this morning, we want to do a little bit of an exercise. Um, Sorry, just I'm trying to play something in the chat. Which is not quite working. 
All right, maybe maybe I can shift gears. I'll I'm going to read us a prayer, just fast as prayer. You can find this prayer at the end of chapter twenty. And um, and so this is just a prayer. You can just listen to it. This is the, the kind of way that we pray authoritatively. And I think many times we don't have the words to to articulate ourselves, to express ourselves, and we don't know what it needs to sound like. And so you can use that as a reference. But I'm going to read it to us this morning. I've adjusted it slightly to more, make it more communal. But this is what it says. It says, in the strong name of Jesus Christ, we stand against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We resist every force that would seek to distract us from our center in God. We reject the distorted con concepts and ideas that make sin plausible and desirable. We oppose every attempt to keep us from knowing full fellowship with God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we speak directly to the thoughts, emotions, and desires of our hearts, and command you to find your satisfaction in the infinite variety of God's love rather than the bland diet of sin. We call upon the good, the true, and the beautiful to rise up within us and the evil to subside. We ask for an increase in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. By the authority of Almighty God, we tear down Satan's strongholds in our lives, in the lives of those we love, and in the society in which we live. We take into ourselves the weapons of truth, righteousness, peace, salvation, the word of God, and prayer. We command every influence to leave. You have no right here, and we allow you no point of entry. We ask for an increase of faith, hope, and love, so that by the power of God, we can be, set, we can be a light set on a hill, causing truth and justice to flourish. These things we pray for the sake of him who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen.